everyone, welcome to my session. I am very excited to be here at Data AI Summit by Databricks. Today, I will be talking about six core components of data modeling success. I hope you will be enjoying during my presentation and take the most out of it. Before diving into the presentation, let me first introduce myself. I have a background in data warehouse modeling, where I was building SQL pipelines, doing the transformation, doing the query optimization. In my current role at uh, SQL DBM, I work as a, a solutions architect. I mainly work close to our users and the product just to make sure SQL DBM meets the user's expect expectations. With that, I'm going to uh, move on to the agenda. I'm going to start with a brief definition of a data model. Then we are going to take a look at of the data modeling types. Then we will explore the six core components of the data modeling success, which are the supporting technology, model management, and uh, communication and collaboration, roles and responsibilities, model governance, and the quality. So what is a data model? I would start first explaining what is a data modeling. Data modeling is a process of designing and visualizing the database. And this process involves defining the entities and the attributes of them, also the relationships between those et, uh, uh, entities. And this model, uh, the output of this uh, modeling process is called as a data model, right? So these data models are represented on ER diagrams, which is called entity relationship diagrams. And this is an example of a data model. On the left side, I have the unity catalog entities that are listed from several schemas and one unity catalog. But if I'm going to review what I have created in my Unity catalog, just going verbally and reading everything, uh, it's just going to be by this information. I have to go inside of every table, each, every single table, looking at the DDL and understand how this table has been created. What are the relationships? When I will be already at the 10th table, I will also forget what was the first one. With that, you can have the higher level of the Unity catalog entity so you can understand what you have already built. This can be done with the reverse engineering, we will get to that, but you can also start modeling from conceptual, then go for logical and implementing the physical database uh, designs. So when it comes to these relational modeling types, which is this exactly what I'm talking about, it is like bottom up or you can do it from top down. So what is a conceptual data model? It is a bird eye view of your Unity catalog or high meta store objects. So we support both. We are going to get to this point. And those are the business concepts. And the next model in type is the logical models that goes even further and more detailed. Means that now my business concepts are called as entities because this would make a lot of sense to the business users rather than calling those entities as tables instead of calling these columns and we can call them as attributes and giving more information, right? Instead of giving some technical names at the columns, we can just use the business descriptions and there where I can collaborate with my business. I am a data person that I am the one who is building this, but the information comes from the business. We need to collaborate. I am not uh, building this because today I just came up with this idea. And the next one is the physical designs, right? Those are the database agnostic models is the next step. Now I collaborate with my business users. Now I know what I'm going to build in the database. And this is the uh, place that I can create the DDL and it's going to look like the output from the forward engineering section. Imagine that I mentioned about two types of modeling practices. If you already built everything in your Unity catalog, you can reverse engineer and then do some schema changes in the tool, then the need will be altered statements. But if I created everything from scratch, I can create the uh, create table statement instead of alter at the forward engineering session. So let's dive into these six core components of the data modeling success. Now I know what's a data model. I am how I'm gonna uh, reach to successful data model. We will get to that why the successful data model is important at the organization. And the first part is Supporting technology. As SQL DBM is a SaaS modeling platform, it has an interaction with other cloud platforms. While doing that, it can also secure. You can sign in the tool using single sign on, or uh, other kind of security pieces can be implemented. This is the advantage of being on the cloud. And this is the only uh, modeling tool that's hosted in the cloud. 
And of course, when we interact with the cloud platform, the other interaction is Databricks. We can directly connect the high meta store and the unit catalog. And this is what it looks like. So here I'm selecting Databricks from the list. And then you can either bring this manually, but we have the direct connection option. From there, you can connect the engineering clusters for high meta store reverse engineering purpose. But I have the Unity Catalog API. Now I'm going to show you this information, how to do that. I just hit connect, and this is the Unity Catalog and multiple schemas that I can select to bring into project. So here on the left side, I have the manage tables, external table, and the views. So I know what I'm bringing into a project, and this is how I can quickly visualize everything. So as you see, there are some uh, relationships, FK, PK, which is the foreign keys and the primary keys, because Unity Catalog support that. So we can reverse engineer, you can visualize. If you are missing something, you can also add it in the tool. So we are going to talk about it. It is going to be with the model management, which is the suggested relationships. So we have physical constraints for the Unity Catalog and the virtual constraints for a high meta store. Because constraints are not the part of your high meta store DDL, because it is not from its origin, because underlying logic comes from the Apache Spark and it just doesn't support. For that, we have the suggested relationships. As you can see here, those suggestions will be based on the naming patterns that you will be defining, and the tool is going to scan your entire project, will give you the suggestions. You can pick and choose and review, so then we can create these virtual constraints. Why it is called virtual? Because this is not going to reflect your DDL. You still keep your high meta store as clean as in your database, but you can still model them using the ER diagrams, using the uh, suggested relationships. So the second piece of the model management is the global modeling, which is very interesting. It has four pillars. One of them is the re global reference. We are going to get into in detail at the next slide. And the global search is also very interesting because instead of searching a single word in a specific project, you will have the ability to search this single word across your account, including all your projects. And the next one is the global standard. So if I created a project, already uh, applied the naming conventions, all the project uh, uh, configurations, do I have to apply the same things when I'm creating another new project? We can create reusable standards for each project with that. And the other one is the lineage. It is similar to the reference. Instead of referencing the object to object, I can do this reference using the lineage at the column level. So the next is going to be the showing how to do this uh, global reference. As you see, I am adding the global project. I select a SQL server project and some tables. So here I can just review what I have brought and with the double click, you will be able to add this table into your native project. Because this table is coming from a SQL server, although I'm working in Databricks project. With that, I can mix different databases in the same project. This can be used for migration process. This can be also used for upgrading from high meta store to Unity catalog, because you still need to collaborate. And with the share option, I can share the project with the collaborators or who is the owner of this table. And I can mention this collaborator's name there. I can keep the communication. Because this table was already modeled in another project. I don't have to remodel this to be able to consume this table in my project. So this is going to save a lot of time. As you see, I can filter this and by the flags or by the colors, etc. This is uh, very similar to the original tables that I'm using here. So you can also filter them because in reality you have hundreds of objects. And the next core components is the communication and the collaboration. As you have just seen that I was able to share my project with some people with, without, with or without edit permission, I need to know where all these communications are being stored. And it is called team communications, which is on the left panel. So you can access full the team uh, comments there. You can look for and who was working on this or who was uh, commenting about what. Everything can be seen through there. As you see, can you hear me, by the way? I guess I lost the connection. Can you hear me? Perfect. All right, so as you see here, I have the project collaborators. I can give edit or non-edit permission. So the people who has the edit permission can collaborate, work with me as a developer, and non-edit permissions will have only the viewer access. Why I need this non-edit permission? Because data modeling is the meeting point of technical and non-technical people. Then I need to collaborate. That's why I don't need to give edit permission, but I need the information from them. And the next one is 
the concurrent modeling is a part of the collaboration. It is not only collaborating with non-technical people. If I am collaborating with the technical people, I should be able to model simultaneously without waiting the other's change to be done. Otherwise, it is going to be time losing waiting because you are working with the large projects, a lot of entities in the same project. Imagine 10 modelers. Everybody is waiting for each other's change. It doesn't make sense to work 10 modelers. That's why we can hit the data mesh approach with that. Decentralized models, decentralized projects. So it is not data models are depending on a single guy anymore. You can work with a lot of people thanks to a merging and branching system in SQL DBM. And of course, now we are collaborating with non-technical people, technical people. It is going to be a little bit confusing who is working what and what kind of roles and responsibilities we have in the project. So we have the uh, project admin. This person is managing the users and giving the access or revoking the access to the projects. And we have data modelers, and these modelers are the ones who are creating the ER diagrams, doing all these modeling steps in the tool. And the consumers are the ones, the weavers, that I can collaborate with non-technical people. But we have also the governance role, who manages this part, the model governance. This is another core component of the data modeling success. As you see here, I have some custom fields created. Maybe you can't see it from further, but it can be basically like owner information that you want to define the owner, which you can't define this in the DDR because DDR is a structured script. You can't add there something as you want because they are the database designs. But if the need is adding more metadata on your project, you can basically use these customized fields and create more metadata like owner is PII or whatever, where it comes from all the information with different types uh, of the fields that you can create it. And, and then we have the option here, generating the reports at the top of this uh, database documentation at the entity. So what I have here at the reports is, I have the physical metadata and the logical metadata all together. This is the compiled version and summarized version at the entity level. So why I'm creating this, because I also want to share this with others. I don't create everything for myself. I do because I'm going to share this with other people, either export an exile or just add those people into my project with different roles. And so far, I've been documenting and adding all the descriptions at the object level, even at the column level, very in detail, very granular. What about my project? I have a project, but I need to define, is this project used for what? And who is working on this project? Then I need the pages. And this is a bit like, a fancier way of creating and writing the things with different formattings and coloring and embedding the links, also the objects from your diagrams. You can also mention people's name, use the list, etc. Now, if a person doesn't have any idea what I'm working on, this person can come and easily read the pages and understand what I'm really building, actually. So I don't really have to communicate using the Slack or Microsoft Teams. The project will talk itself. So I'm going to save this person's time. Also, I will save my own time. We will respect each other's time like that. So when it comes to data modeling success, the quality is very important because the, we have been all the time talking about the real data quality, how I'm going to do the data profiling and et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to metadata, this is as important as the real data because those are the structures of your real data because imagine that I can have a table which doesn't have any real data inside, just to create table, the list of the columns, but select star gives me nothing because there's no data in it. But I can't have any data without this table, right? I need this table. The data quality comes from first your metadata quality. If I'm going to have the redundancy, duplicated column, imagine probably you already have like multiple times customer table with underscore A, B, C, D, whatever, whatever. When it comes to quality, I always believe it starts from the metadata. So for that, we have some templates that can be done by the columns. You can create the column templates to automate this column generation with some standards. For example, I have a, a contract ID, but I don't have this contract ID only on contract table. And there's another table using this contract ID as well. But I want the consistency in terms of the data type, in, ser in terms of the de description, the comment for this column. I can make this happen using the column templates or audit columns, like frequently used columns, ETL columns, created by, etc. 
With that, I don't have to recreate those columns all the time. I can just assign them using this column template. And similarly, just below that part, we have the table templates. This can make the data vault modeling automation process easier because we have these table templates you can use for the data vault automation. Not 100%, but just to make the process easier because it is not uh, exactly addressing to this use case. That's why we only have them as default, but you can create your own template and customize, giving the prefixes, coloring, etc. And the second part is the glossary. Either I can define some case standards, what kind of standards I will use at the forward engineer. My DDL will be created, but is it gonna be uppercase, camel case, what kind of case? You can define this. And also there's another section, the name mapping, that you can define the naming standards to your constraints as well. Everything is gonna be automated. Since you define that, everything will be reflect to your project as well. And another section is the glossary. This is used for renaming the objects. Imagine you have employee, but you wanna call this EMP. You just create a list or upload it from an exile. If you already had this list, list uh, you will be able to rename these objects from the glossary section. Of course, error warnings, this is my favorite part, because as you can create the objects in the tool or modify them, uh, you can make some mistakes, like human errors. I double click on the table, I added a column, but I forgot adding a uh, data type. And in this case, I'll have the create table statement, list of the columns, but without a data type, it is going to fail in Databricks. Even before get to that, the tool is going to recognize and will give you some errors and warnings just for like alerting purpose. It is not real errors that you can't move on, you can't move further, but definitely you can do it, just kind of alerting. For example, default constraints in Databricks, you may know about that, you need to use a special table property to do that. The table property should be default constraint, which is supported. If you don't have this, you can generate a default constraint on the column. So the tool is going to warn you, hey, you are defining the default constraint, but you are missing the table property. This uh, table uh, templates can be used for defining the default table properties as well. So it's the same logic. As you are adding the audit columns all the time, I don't have to define this um, table properties, default table properties all the time when I'm creating a table. You can just use the table properties for that. So for, uh, for today, that's all from my site. And thank you very much for joining my session. And you might actually ask me why the data modeling uh, success is important. I touched based on it a little bit, the importance of it, why it is very significant. But if you have any questions, uh, we still have some kind of one minute you can ask. If we are running out of the time, please stop by booth 20. This is where I will be and meeting you in person. Okay, thank you so much.